Barras, estoy muy honrado de volver acá, pero hoy hay de hablar en inglés, porque si comienzo, si empiezo a hablar portugués, no comprendes nada, es embarazoso. So, in English, please. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for, for being here, and thanks for inviting me here, because it's always fantastic to be here in San Sebastián. I've been here three times. So, coming after John Haggerty is quite a task, not easy. Presented work that had been awarded and recognized all over the place for years and years and years, and we know each other for at least, I would say, 25 years. So it's fantastic. So now I'm not showing any any work at all because my, the title of my presentation is "I Came, I Saw, and I Sold." And I sold my agency in September last year, and I left advertising for a while. Definitely. So I'm not in a board, I'm not sitting somewhere trying to make an appearance as an old school advertising guy and get some money out of a board member or something like this. So I'm just out of advertising, I sold it completely. So I'm going to show you and talk about what I experienced, what I lived and what I saw and what I'm seeing is happening in the industry now and at the end I'm going to tell you a bit why I sold. So let's see if I, this is working. Okay, first, I came. So I'm, I have 35 years in advertising, 23 of which as a partner of our Mappi video. So I studied in Germany, I studied in Germany, I worked at GGK, which is a fantastic agency, a Swiss agency that had a wonderful agency in, in Germany. Uh, I worked in Munich in a small agency as well. Then I left, after seven years I came home, Brazil. I was at DPZ, a marvelous, beautiful agency founded by two Spanish guys, Aracosa and Petit. Uh, then I left DPZ, went to BMI, that was later bought to DDP and became a really famous agency. Then I left BMI to become partner and own my own agency. I always wanted to be owner of my agency. I didn't want to be a director or a president. I wanted to have my own place. So, uh, I studied seven years in Germany and I'm in Brazil, so somehow I have yeah, two opposites. One is a chaotic environment like Brazil, very colorful, very chaotic, and German engineering discipline is complete. Those are completely opposites. And they, those opposites made me, or made my career actually what it is. So in 1993, just before, or just two, two weeks after I left EM9, and become partner of the video in our uh, I won the Grand Prix Cup, and I started two weeks ago, two weeks later, in an agency that was almost broke, but had very good clients, but all the clients were leaving. So we had a very hard time to bring this agency back to life and make it, it big again. So in this 24 years or 24 years that we run on March, we won three times Agents of the Year in Cannes, Times the most awarded agent by Gun Report. So we did it really, really well. And it became a really big agency. And now it's been run by a very good friend of mine, Luis Sanchez, who worked with me for 12 years, 18 years, and now he's doing a good job and following the steps. So this is a brief report of how much what, what it was. But we are an agency without a vision. And there's a reason for that. I remember seven years after we started an agency. We have developed a lot of great work, not great work, but good work, and some of them, some of them are, we can call it great work. And then I went, I was invited to go to Buenos Aires to a speech in a FIAP, and I opened, sorry. And then I have to give a speech, and I prepared about slides. At that time we used slides. I don't know, most of you have no idea what a slide is, but we had slides. And then I prepared the presentation and had about 15 films, 25 ads, and maybe 20 billboards. And I was just discussing the work and the way we work. And then I, wa I watched two presentations before me. There was one guy that's founded an agency, has a very good agency. I think it was Spain, I don't remember exactly, but he talked about 35 minutes about visions visions, visions, what they stand for, what they stand for. At the end they showed three commercials only. And two commercials were 
boring, and one was good. And it's like, oh, something's wrong. The guy has a lot of vision, but very few commercials. And the second guy came in after, and uh, two guys just started an agency in, in Argentina, and they invited 35 employees to come on stage with a piece of paper in their hand. It was a happening, like an art happening. And had a piece of paper with 45 laws that they even had, amendments, right? how they should do. And they were all reading this. And I felt uncomfortable. See? They finished reading the 45 and show a bunch of nice image of the work they had done in former agencies and so on. And it felt like, I felt like, wow, something's wrong. 45 amendments. Moses tried 10. And I ask you if you know by heart all the 10. I mean, five. But 45, when reading them, felt a little bit weird. And I came back and then my, my time was said, guys, I don't have a vision. We started working seven years ago like crazy to save an agency that was almost broke, trying to get clients and make money and do work that we are proud of. So I'm going to show some, some work. So till now, I think we never had a vision. We never came together and said, those are the things that we believe in. At the end of 25 years, there are a couple of things that stand out, but I'm not the one who's going to write it down and make a law for the agency. I think the moment, the moment you make laws, you are dead. So, things that we have, we don't know, have a vision, we have some attitudes. We never participate in pitches in 25 years of agency. This is for some reason because don't ask me to give you for free the only thing I have to sell. So we lose time, we lose, and you have to build an agency with an attitude, with work that you can show the client and say, trust me, you know the market, you know the agencies, please trust me. If you don't trust me, go somewhere else and ask for a prize and money. So, pitches are, now in Brazil at least, most of the time, they are looking for money, costs, and not much for creative work, which is a pity. Something else that we have as well, we never worked for government or for public companies in Brazil. And if you read what's happening in Brazil at the moment, I don't have to explain why we sleep, we sleep so well. Mm -hmm. And things that I saw working in the creative department as complex as a, as a lot of videos. It's a big agency, so we have a lot of creative people. You know? But to work and to develop campaigns and how to find out how to make good work, I remember, and I'm getting old, so I remember just two things. And the first one is, seja simples, in bom português, be simple, be as simple as possible. And simple is a necessity in a country that has so many differences between culture, cultural people, educated people, rich people, poor people, people in the north, in the south, in the west, and in, in the east. Brazil is very complex, very diverse. So, to be simple is a necessity. And you have to make a, a, a campaign that people get in a second. There's no much space for subtleties in a country like this. You have to be direct, objective, and short. So, it's something that I learned in, in Germany, which is the art of reduction. To reduce an idea, a question, to a single, single, single sentence, which should be very simple, very direct, and try to make it so powerful as possible. The John Marie Drew, which used to be the TWA head, in Paris, and the worldwide uh, creative director of TWA was once chairman of the Jewish camp, and he won a couple of lines, and I went on stage to get them, and then he came back to me and said, "In France, your work would never be approved by a creative director." I say, since he's French, I think he's insulting me. So asking me why? It's like because it's too simple. French creators like complexity. They have to be very complex. The more complex, the better. And they want to see simple ideas don't work for a French advertiser. It's like, okay. So to you guys, but I think still believe that it should be simple. And David Trott, he's a great guy in England that I love, and he writes a lot of nice books and very nice speech. He seems complicated, seems clever only to stupid people. Make a message simple, direct, and understandable. Well, so the first thing is be simple, to the simple. And the second one is be unpredictable. 
And unpredictability is something that I think is important because people are not aware, not talking about advertising. They don't care about advertising as much as we do. And as now that I left advertising, the first thing I did is to get rid of all the bookmarks of all the magazines about advertising, design, whatever it is. And this just a couple of months without any news of advertising. And what happened is, is suddenly after 35 years, I became a normal human being that doesn't care about advertising. And then I realized that much of the work that we make so much, so much buzz about it is not relevant. It's it doesn't, doesn't work as we think it should work. And this is for me a, a very hard lesson to learn. And so it has to be unpredictable. You have to take people uh, by surprise. You have to ambush them. So, but being simple and unpredictable is sometimes very difficult. Because being simple and unpredictable is almost like finding the obviety, obvious. Eh? To be obvious is very difficult for the first time. If you're obvious in the second time, it's just simple and predictable, which is the dead advertising. So, I have some reflections, considerations about how to run the great department that I learned in, in, the, in the past 35 years. You know, the, the career path of advertising guy is from assistant. When you were a very good assistant, you became maybe a great uh, art director or a copywriter. But I have to say that a copywriter has to have a minimum sense of good taste for design and art and so on. It has to be a, a poor copywriter that is almost blind to design, fashion and good taste is won't survive in our industry. At the same time, the art director that doesn't write well, I think this is not good enough. So today you have to be both. So you have to become an art director. And then you become you're very successful, you become a creative director. And then you are start to lead a, a creative department. And then, if you are very successful, become executive vice president. So it's just a way to say to get more money. And then, if you are very successful in that, you maybe become a vice president worldwide, creative director of a big company. And this is, for me, the worst job at all. Because we're traveling all over the place, getting a lot of miles, going to the offices and talking to people, trying to inspire them, and then going to juries, speeches, and then you'll become a, a jury professional. You're in all the juries, all this chairman, and then it's like a boring, boring, boring thing. And you're not doing stuff anymore. And then if you're very good at that, you might be an owner if you start an own, own agency, and then you get your path, and you finish this, you write a book about creativity and advertising, and you go home. So that's more or less what's happening. And what makes me I wonder a little bit, at least in Brazil, I don't know if it's the same in Spain, as soon as a good creative, art director of copyright, hits a big campaign, a nice campaign, a beautiful campaign, one maybe a gold line, he comes home and becomes a creative director. There must be a reason why no army in the world has a channel at 25 years old. There must be a reason. If you become a creative director too soon, you are becoming, you're going to burn out very fast. You start, when you start doing stuff that you like, that you produce, you become a director and you start, you stop doing things that makes you come so far. So it's, it's quite sad. People are burning out very fast. And I think creatives should go to the finance department, the CFO of the companies, and ask for money and not for titles. Good work should be awarded with money and not titles. We should not be fooled by our egos that become our great directors. We should get more money and not more titles. So, one thing that I also learned a lot is, since you're, and this is another sense that, that works for when you're working in a, comp in a great department, and you should never work under someone who is not better than you. And sometimes these young generals, these young creative directors, are not ready to be better than one guy who is maybe 35 years old and maybe is doing such, such great work. And people get really frustrated. And once you're in the creative department, I always try, I better prefer to slow down, slow down the crazy guys and to push the nice, team-working 
guy that says yes to all the planning department, to everybody. I think I like the mysteries. I like the crazy people in the creative department. It's not very political correct because we live in a country in a time everybody says teamwork is everything. Teamwork, teamwork. Teamwork, yes. But you have to have crazy ones on your team. People that doesn't fit, that complain. They are uncomfortable with what we are doing, uncomfortable with the briefing, uncomfortable with the profession itself. I remember working in Germany where the creative people were not, did they come from creative departments or from advertising agency? They came from the art school, they came from the bar, they came from the philosophy, uh, philosophy uh, chair in a, in a university. They were people that were really uncomfortable and they were doing maybe advertising just for a period of time. But they brought something fresh. Now we have professionals. Everybody is so professional, so well educated in advertising. But advertising is just a reflection of life. So I would rather have people that live hard and maybe not fit well in the machinery of advertising than to have only team working nice guys. Uh, as a creative director, it's important to know what you want if you don't. And this is. Uh, there's nothing worse than a creative director that doesn't know what he wants, has no clue what he wants, and behave like clients that just send briefings and briefings until they find something they like. So a creative director has to find a way to know exactly what he wants, even if he doesn't. And there is two ways of doing this, at least for me, trying to answer two questions. The first is just make a line. What do we want to say? And briefings there, I love briefings that have two lines. What do you want to say? Then you have to work hard, the planning department with creative people, with the clients, to find what we want to say. And then, before you start working, you have to ask yourself, is what you want to say relevant? This is important, this doesn't make the consumer tick. Does it take the consumer out of the lethargy? Uh, we saw here John Haggerty showing some work that did exactly as that. They know exactly what they want to say and it was relevant at that time. So, uh, and John said something that I, I agree 100% but nowadays it's not always the truth. The product, product, the service, should be in the center of the message, should be the hero. Uh, I learned that with Phil Dusenberry, that my, many of you might never heard of. He died maybe 10 years ago, and he was the chief creative director of BBDO in the 80s when they launched the big, huge Pepsi campaign, the challenging campaign that challenged Coke, the choice of a new generation, that won, won every single award all over the place. And every single execution happened around a can of Pepsi. It was fantastic. Now we see advertising that try to inspire people, try to reflect attitudes of life, uh, but doesn't have the product on the same. So if you watch any commercial, many of the commercials, you can actually see words or like inspiration, do your best. And if you change the product or the brand, it doesn't make any difference because the images are quite the same. So put the product in the center, put the benefit in the center, and then you have some distinctive advertising. Uh, and it's something that for me, it's fantastic, clear, that the cliché uh, is something that <laughs> comforts the cowards in the client room, in the agency as well, and, and protect the mediocre people in the, in the creative department, in the clients, and in the blended department agency as well. So we are always fighting the cliché. Understanding what a cliché is, and a cliché could be a feeling, could be an image, could be a music, could be a line, could be a word. Fighting the cliché is absolutely necessary. Because cliché is very easy. Clients want to buy cliché. They want to be comfortable. They want to see something that their competitor is doing. They don't want to be different, like John said. Being different is very difficult. So cliché is the normal path where you sit and be comfortable. And that's, I think, is ruining advertising nowadays more than ever. And there's a reason for that that I come later. Uh, what I see is coming. Uh, this is what happens in the last five, six years. That everything that you go to a jury member or a jury, everyone 
in all the magazines, all the publications about advertising, all the seminars you watch, everyone is looking for the new. Everything that's new is good, but it's not true. Not everything that's new is good. You know, everything that's good is new. People are trying to get in this innovation stress we are in and try to find work that is breaking the boundaries of the new. And it becomes kind of cliche itself because new change very fast into the old and good stuff lives forever. You show in three, 30 years time something that was labeled new today, it's going to be old. Show something that is brilliant today in 30 years time, the chances it's still brilliant is huge. So aim for the brilliant and not for the new. And the jury, and if you go to any festival today, you have maybe 45 categories, and every single category is awarding the new. And you have all the jury members trying to find the new. But if you remember some stuff that has been awarded in the last five, six years, it might be today for forgettable. And some of the work that you see here, I'm not showing any work on our map, but I hope the work that we have done can last the test of time. And about storytelling, which is something that I hate the word, storytelling. Now they invent another one, the story doing, which is another bullshit. So, Cervantes was going into storytelling. Everybody, we are doing storytelling. We're telling the story of the brand. We were responsible, we were responsible telling the story of a brand, of a service, of a product, the product truth of, our, of any, any product. So we are responsible for doing this for ages. You shot a commercial with one minute, you're telling a story. But our storytelling become a kind of a mantra. And the client says, I want storytelling. Define storytelling for me. And the client starts, oh yeah, you see, you see, every single piece of air has to tell the same story together. I said, no, we're doing this for ages. We just change the name. And story doing is now happening on the streets. We have another, another action. So I think we are celebrating irrelevance when we start talking about stuff that is poor bullshit. So talk about what's happening now with the hacker, the hackers Napster and the ideology of the free lunch. I call it socialism digital. A couple of years ago, you probably can remember, it was a truth that information should be free, music should be free, entertainment should be free. So all the hackers, Napster was the first that made music available to everybody for free. And this, the new blogs, the blogs, the journalism, the magazines, the newspapers, they suffered because suddenly, it was a sin to pay for information. You have to get it free, because this is what is sociological. So this so uh, socialism started in the US, the least socialist country in the world, but they had to say free, everything should be free. And all the media companies struggled. And many of the media big houses died because they couldn't actually get money out of the work of the information, their content. So, it almost killed the music industry. Two Steve Jobs and find a way to people to get money or buy buy some stuff on the internet. Then start to change this ideology of free lunch. And now Apple Store became Spotify, but you still have to pay. People are getting money. So the music industry is finding this a way to get money. But if you see all the magazines, the magazines are disappeared because they cannot make money out in, in the web. It's very difficult for them. And I talk about revolution, the digital revolution comes in waves. If you remember the Russian Revolution, it all started about getting rid of the Tsar, and they want to have a parliament and a kind of uh, social, social democratic, kind of uh, democratic government. They started like this, and then the Bolsheviks came in the second wave, they, they started a new movement, then there was a civil war, and then at the end, the third or fourth wave of this revolution, Lenin died and started to over and change the whole story of the uh, Russian Revolution. It began, it began like something and it turned out something completely different in the end. And nobody knew exactly what the next wave would bring. 
So everybody is moving and doing, doing like moving with the going with the flow. So the, the first wave of digital technology was like we all remember this HTML kind of structure. You have very difficult to use. You have to dial all the, the type, all the, the address. These banners were amazingly stupid. So you have banners and banners and banners. All the agencies were doing banners and nobody was clicking on the banner. So it was very unfriendly for advertising, even for communication, because it was a design produced by engineers. And then desktop, you have to go to your computer, you have to, at least you have a notebook, you can have to walk with your computer on the streets, you cannot be on a bus with your desktop and read the news, but it was the first wave. And the second wave came in, and then you remember you have more, uh, then you have the Facebooks or the old codes, the first one, I don't know if you are familiar with old codes, because it was a huge thing. And then you have something that people say, I remember a second life, you might remember what Second Life was, this environment where everybody was having... Eh? And I remember agencies in the US and Brazil developing branches for the Second Life. All the brands should be in the Second Life. Everybody's going to be in, have an avatar. It's going to be a world that we can actually connect. People are talking about having sex now in, in the Second World, getting babies, and you have all the companies going in, banks and so on. It less maybe. 11 months, I won't say one year, 11 months. And now nobody has a second life uh, avatar. And the word avatar is long now to a film, not to a second life. So, so it's second, the second wave is just starting people, are starting to communicate in a, in a way. And now we have the third wave, where everything is not on the mobile. So we are living, we cannot live without the mobile. So we have the mobile, we have the Facebooks, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, so social media dominates our this moment of this revolution. We are all connected to social media. <coughs> and now I talk about social media and drug trafficking. It's, it's not in a bad sense, I don't think drugs are so bad at all, but I just make it a connection here. Imagine a drug trafficker goes to a university and start giving for free a new drug. Everybody loves it, it's great, fantastic. I haven't tasted this drug. Great, wonderful. Ooh. And after one year, you start charging a bit. Then after two years, you are fully addicted and you want to pay anything you want. Social media was worked like that. The beginning of social media, everything was for free. So you put a, you made a commercial you put on social media, and then the concept of virus starts spreading. Everybody said, wow, we made a, such a beautiful film that everybody is spreading, and every single one becomes uh, their own media. So you just spread. And the clients became kind of crazy. Why should I pay a million dollars to put a commercial on global TV, on network, if I can produce some nice stuff, put on social media for free? Huh? So I remember the clients coming. Make me a viral, please. Make me a viral. <laughs> and then we start production. The production costs were much higher than the, the media costs. There was no media costs at all. So clients became addicted. So it was very good for the social media to have this concept of sharing. And then suddenly they start charging. Charging. And so they changed the algorithm to zero. So you have to pay if you want to put something on social media you have to pay. I think it is fair and I think it is the best thing that happened to our economy. Because once again, there is no free lunch. We should not be uh, in the utopic world of free lunch if we work member. I think it's fantastic. The best thing that happened is that we have to pay to put our work in there. Because now the production company, the production value has to be high. They have to be good. You pay. And when you pay something, you value it more. And I think it's good for everybody. So, Netflix, Facebook, and Instagram. There are three examples of things that I, I like to discuss. Netflix, everybody's talking about the phenomenon of Netflix. But the good stuff about Netflix is not the availability of the films that you can actually pay maybe $10 a month. You can have all the films, all the series, all TV. 
and so on. This is actually kind of a spot file. What made, made spot, uh, Netflix interesting for me is when they start producing content. When they did House of Cards, they made a huge shift. Not because they produced something, because they produced something splendid, fantastic, great, great entertainment. And they put in there on air all the episodes at the same time. They broke the media uh, way of the habit of watching TV for everybody. But they did it producing great piece of content. It's not distribution, it's content. And this is for me, the, the, nobody would be talking about Netflix if they wouldn't, or net that much, if they wouldn't have produced House of Cards. Facebook, Facebook is my, one of my favorite media companies in the world, not social media, media companies. And I was there with um, Mark Darcy, which is great director of Facebook, he invited me a couple of years ago to be in the, in the board, gravy board of Facebook. And it was a nice way of sharing ideas and understanding and learning about this completely new world for every one of us. And the fantastic thing about Facebook is, and Mark Darcy told me, I said, we, Marcelo, we were in many juries in Cannes. And in the digital jury, everything awarded, everything awarded was very complex. You have the famous 360 degrees of communication, you have kind of uh, apps that connect with the outdoor, with your mobile, and then you write something and have a QR code that connects with something. All this bullshit, these words, not mine, uh, got goals because they were so complex. And people thought digital should be very complex because offline communication like films, and this is simple, but digital should be complex. And people said, we have to make, we have to go differentiate ourselves from the offline to be complex, be difficult, be technological. And he told me, behind the scenes in Facebook, he understood that everything that worked, were really worked, the shareable work, were five second videos, 15 second videos, 30 second videos, maybe when really good, one minute, 60 second videos. So videos were turning that all over the place. And what did Facebook a couple of years ago, and now it's doing brilliantly, change the whole platform to video. Now you watch video all over the place. And now they are selling the space, like every single media company, to you share the videos. It's fantastic. It's great. And I, I, I challenge Facebook that in a couple of years, they're going to buy the Olympics game, the rights for the Olympics, and they're going to put on our pages Imagine you have a badminton game between Uganda and Mongolia. Who are going to watch a badminton game between Uganda and Mongolia? Besides people from Uganda and people from Mongolia. So you can sell for the First Bank of Mongolia the rights to show it on Facebook. You have every time for First Bank of Mongolia, and you people are going to watch. So they can actually have all this TV feed of the Olympic Games and make money all over the place selling stuff that people want to watch in their homes, or maybe a small group of people. It's going to change a lot the way we see media and you see sharing content and communication. I'm, I'm definitely going to do it once in a while. The next one is Instagram. And for me, it's my favorite uh, social media because it's, for me, it's a new print media. It's an image, a line. Maybe it's just an image, but never just a line. But it's fantastic. It's a print media in square format. Imagine you have, at least in Brazil, we have many people that they have a special interest in fashion and have young girls that sell a small post for $15,000, just a post, when they wear the clothes of some, some brand. And they have maybe 2 million followers. And you imagine a Vogue magazine in Brazil. You have to print it, you have to cut the tree, you have to make the paper, you have to print it, you have to make a photograph, you have to call an agency, you make an agency, you think about the concept, you make a line, you sell to the client, you make research, you wait one month, the magazine comes out, and maybe 120 people are going to watch it. Probably, but they're going to be among a lot of stuff. And one, face, one Instagram of one person that has maybe 2 million viewers is going to charge $15,000 and make it the next day. 
so it's easy. So it's changing a lot. And it's very difficult for the print media, for instance, to fight something like this. And what we're seeing today is the creatives going all to the technology industry. I was in one of these meetings in Facebook, and I remember coming out and having lunch with a couple of very good creatives from the US, and very, very good creatives, and three of them were discussing with me new apps that want to start, startups. They want to be startups, and they say, I have an app that chews food. Well, I'm tired. They know exactly how tired I am, how many calories I spend a day with my race that counts how, many exercise, how much exercise I do and automatically send the food that I need at home for me. What do you think about that? Like, oh, I don't know. And I'm looking for investors. I'm looking for investors. So people are trying to make, out of one idea, a couple of million dollars. We were in a business. We have three ideas a week to try to sell the clients for a few bucks. So it's a completely different day game. But creatives are thinking, well, that's, I'm going to make a million dollars with one single idea. <laughs> it's changed. Uh, of all those, the return of those who never went is about the video. The video is back. And this is fantastic. I think it's great. I think the digital revolution came back to video. And everything that we share today is based on video or uh, a photograph or very simple things. So I think it's fantastic for us. Um, and this is something that I've been struggling a lot. The end of the mass advertising or mass media. And it's all about fragmentation. Everything we do today is fragmented. If you go to any category, you go to Spotify, you go to music, everything is fragmented. If you go to our special interests, here maybe a couple of surfers, the way today are really good, and the couple of surfers, they have, a, they have this environment, this universe inside surfing that is huge. And a lot of things happen there. If you are you like bikes, you have the whole universe of bikes and uh, bikers. You are in a fashion, you are in, in food. You have many, many interests. In, in, inside this interest is a huge, huge universe, but very small galaxies in, in this side. So instead of mass media, we are talking now about niches. And the problem is those niches are not connected. In the past, if you make an advertising on TV or on a Sunday night, you're probably going to have all the people watching the same stuff. You put it on a TV or maybe in magazines or on the streets. Everybody was watching the same stuff. Today, nobody's watching the same stuff. Everybody watching their own world or own uh, universe. Everybody's encapsulated in his own universe. And that's it's very difficult because it's making our work difficult because maybe the work that we do is very relevant in this universe, but completely irrelevant in another one. So this is uh, trying to make the connections very hard today. And I can remember stuff that we saw today the Levi's campaign. The Levi's campaign was in all the, all the cinemas. They were on television in Brazil, was on the television in the US, and television everywhere. So they had one message, one everybody was watching. Now, everything is fragmented. And the clients has become, they have difficulty of in being not so relevant anymore. Maybe it's just relevant in a small universe, but not anywhere. And they try to find these people that are charismatic enough to spread the news. Now those guys there, one surfer, Gabriel Medina in Brazil, he has four million people following him on Instagram. Four million people. He's almost bigger than the audience of TV Global in a, a night. It's huge. And so these guys, the so clients are trying to find those guys to spread a message, but these four million people are just surfers or maybe people that like surfing. But what about the other 196 million people in Brazil? And this is something that to me is very important now is we are in the business of selling something, making something interesting, so interesting that people can buy. We, don't, we should not fool ourselves to think that we are doing something else than selling. These are the, the, the new guy, new generation, and the work that we are going to 
went to watch all today is it's all about being good, being nice, and doing the best. Okay, it's fine. But you shouldn't forget that you're selling something. Uh, new creative guys that came to our agency, that came to our agency, didn't like to be in advertising. Advertising is just something like, mm, it's not good, not good, not good enough. <laughs> and with social media, and I'm going to talk a lot, a lot about that, is we became kind of trapped in the trap of being well, of being doing good, and so on. If you don't do good, you are you're going to be killed very fast. Yeah? So, like the sort of being is not a good person. So you have to be good. If you are good, you have to be diverse. You have to be diverse. If you are not diverse, you are, you are dead. And if you go to social media, I think every one of you has the experience of having a campaign that some people don't like. They don't want to kill you with arguments they are absolutely crazy. So, the politically correct is something that is killing most of the advertising today. Anything you put on air, you have someone who's going to be to find an angle that's going to kill it. So what makes this makes the clients really, really unsafe, really angry, and really afraid. So in the social media, is somehow putting all the content of advertising today in a square of where you cannot move. So people are complaining about the creativity is there, the people are not so creative anymore. There is a reason for that, because if you think out of the box, you, the chance that you're going to be killed by social media is huge. And the clients know that. So the clients are avoiding them. And that's when it became what the cliches are coming back. Because you have to be well, inspire people, be nice, go to the beach, turn your arms, and the camera goes around, and have nice music. And then you feel safe, because then social media cannot kill you. But there is a danger that the brands doesn't, doesn't understand that they are not, even the Pope Francisco is infallible now. This, this concept, you are perfect, you cannot make a mistake, is dead. And the brands still have a faith, you are, are still afraid to confess that they made a mistake. They react very badly to social media. They don't know how to react, they don't know how to tell a story and say, sorry, I made a mistake, but I'm going to make this. They, they cannot, the dialogue is very hard. And then we as advertisers, we have to behave well, so the brain doesn't go into hell of social media. And behaving well, then we go to a, to a position where we have to tell a story or the truth is very inconvenient. Because every single brand is trying to be nice, to be good, to save the planet, to be fantastic, to be socially responsible. Every single brand is trying to save the planet. And then I ask myself, who is the hero, the put the son of a bitch, who is trying to shift? And we are helping to create this kind of environment of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a real danger. We are very close to hypocrisy with all the work we are doing. I tell a story, this one, just one that John told the story of John, uh, Keep Walking. It was a brilliant campaign. And as he said, Keep Walking is the NEA of the brand. There is a guy walking. Keep Walking, John Walker. Ha! It's great. It's great. It fits the NEA. Now they have a campaign, and so, since I'm not in advertising, I can say bad things about work from colleagues because I'm free. So now it's a campaign that says optimism brings you further. I watched a commercial in Brazil as a normal consumer. I didn't know, I didn't saw in the review in magazines and so on. I just watched a commercial out of the blue. Optimism brings you further. And then we saw two guys going to a slum in Brazil, painting art on the house of people. They're happy, everybody's singing, everybody's helping them, and they are producing their own work on, on the house of other people. Arm people, poor people. So, I look at them and say, optimism bring. And I said, I, I just feel uncomfortable. Because the concept of keep walking, first, is based on the DNA of the brand. John Walker, keep walking. It's persistence, go. Optimism, we're not getting a couple 
a glass of whiskey. Of course, again, I drink two whiskeys and I become optimist. <laughs> makes sense, makes sense, but this is the truth we want to tell about the category. This is that. So you're doing good around the world, you're spreading optimism, so you're spreading whiskey for free. This hypocrisy is very close. And you can actually change optimism. This brings you further. You can put Intel. You can put whatever brand you like. It works for everything. Keep walking out. It's Johnny Walker. It's easy. Done. Perfect. But now we are producing a lot of stuff that is interchangeable and very close to hypocrisy. Very close. There is one chart that I'd like to show you before I go to my end. It's a, it's a nice word about brain leverage. You know? The guy is selling ships, and if you wrote the letter from Salting Crunch, sharing family happiness for peace, and the guy say, I think we can go higher. So, suddenly we have uh, potato ships trying to save the world and the planet. So it's too much. I think, I think it's too much. And we have to take care that our need our to do something good not ended in a purpose. We have to look back and look exactly what we are doing. And this is something that we do, we did in the agency all the time. We have to be devil's advocate when we are creating things. So, to the end, a lot of people ask me why I sold agency after 25 years. And there is a story about two stories. One is the five, uh, five miles, 100 miles of Indianapolis, you, you don't, it's, it's just a circle that you run and run and run and run, and after four hours, you win. The one that goes easy, but you win. And like, I think, as an agency, we won a couple of times the 500 miles of Indianapolis. And the first, the feeling for the first time is amazing, amazing. You are just fantastic. You just went to the Everest. And then you do it again. You went again to the Everest. And then you did four or five times. The feeling you got the fifth time is not as crisp and clear like the first. On the fifth time, you remember the 500 times you are just sitting in this ship. And then maybe two years later, you become number three, and then you are a failure. But you still have done 500 circles, and you are still busy. So it became like, this intense routine of doing creative stuff without pausing and looking exactly what, we are, what I was doing. And the second thing is Tostoy. When I was 29, I was launching Alma Bibidio, going to this immense challenge of taking care of Asian and become an owner of my own agency. I didn't know exactly, I think there's a line that says, uh, the stupid are the heroes, no? because they don't know the dangers ahead. They don't feel it. And I was a little bit stupid and said, let's go it, and let's do it. And we did very good and very nice. But at that time, I read a, a short story, a story called uh, How Much Land Does a Man, uh, Man Need? It's all about a farmer in old Russia, and he's living with a small piece of land with his cow, his chickens, his, uh, his, his wife and his family. And one day my friend came in and said, why don't you buy another land and you can make bigger? And he said, no, I'm fine. This is enough for my family, They're gonna, it's enough for my kids, they're going to have this land when I, die, when I die. And outside of the window, the devil was watching and taking, pay attention to this conversation. And the devil said, ah, I'm going to change this guy. But the next day, the guy woke up and said, I was thinking about what my friend said, I'm going to buy this land. And the wife, why should you do it? So I'm going to buy this land. He bought another land. And then he bought another land. We go, go on and buy all the land around him. And he becomes a huge landowner. But he was so unsatisfied that he has to buy more. And so he goes to another country. He buys there, he buys there. And then one day he heard, he listened to a story about a tribe out in Siberia that were giving for free all the land you can find. So he took his, his horse, went all the way to Siberia, 
and find on a small mountain the tribe and the sheep. The sheep was a devil. And the, the, the devil, as a sheep, tell him, you can walk in any direction. You can mark the land uh, as much as you want. And all the land that you mark is yours. But you have to be back on top of the mountain at 6 o'clock when, when the sun sets. Otherwise, you'll lose everything. And the guy stops. Okay, he chose a direction and went marking. By noon, when the sun was very high, was the time to come back. He looked at the I was like, I'm going to take more land. And took more land. And look, looked at what? More land. And I said, now it's time to run and come back. And he stopped running. And he runs and runs and runs. And the sun is going down, going down, going down. And he climbs the, the mountain, almost all not weaving. And then he came back and the devil said, you did it. But the guy died immediately because he was so exhausted. And then they made a cave, and the devil says, smiling, so many land, at the end, he ends up with two meters by one meter. I read that when I was 29. And by 28, uh, by 48, around 48, I thought, I think, I, have, I think my noon has come. It's time to come back and watch what I have done and enjoy a little bit. And then that's why I sold my partner and myself decided to sell. No jobs, no titles, and I'm going to be in Hawaii for one year surfing. It's warmer than here, and then after that I come back to Brazil and see if Brazil still stands. It's, it makes sense to open maybe a design studio, maybe an advertising agency, maybe something else. But I'm going to draw and paint for the rest of the next two years, and I just enjoy to be here and share this with you. That's it. Thank you.